So my name is Brigadier General Patrick Michaelis. I'm the current commanding general at the Army Training Center in Fort Jackson. And I've been here since the summer of 2021. Fort Jackson was um, one of the 32 camps that were created around the Southeast United States in support of World War I. Uh, so a $50,000 grant from the Columbia Chamber of Commerce bought the land on behalf of the federal government um, in 1917 and uh, Fort Jackson was created to, to train the 81st Division which is still have a presence here on post today. After World War I it went dormant and during World War II it was stood back up as a, as a federal post uh, training eight of the divisions that fought in World War II. And after World War II, it went into essentially what it's designed for today, which is training um, citizens to become soldiers and developing leaders for the Army and for the nation. I uh, went through a 90-day review uh, when I came on board, just like anyone at this level should probably do, uh, where I really started to ask some questions over, over what we're doing here at Fort Jackson is in line with uh, what the Army is telling us to do and where society is at today. And most of the priorities that were, that were on the board were the right ones, and I added some others. So I have four priorities that I, that, that I organize the entire post around uh, and all of our decision uh, battle rhythms that we have here on, on Fort Jackson. Uh, the first is our core purpose, which is training and developing leaders. So training and developing leaders is, is, is why Fort Jackson exists. And when we think about training, we think about Fort Jackson being the gateway to the Army. Um, roughly 60% of anyone who enlists in the Army comes to Fort Jackson and goes through the transformational experience from citizen to soldier. So we wanna make sure that is a first class experience in a 10 week period, that psychological and physical transformation um, that allows these young men and women from wherever they come from, uh, from any walk of life, to come here and be proficient to be able to shoot, move, communicate, and survive, but also a transference of the, of the Army's values, which are a subcomponent or a function of national values, which are a function of universal truths. We want that transference uh, um, into their character that they carry forward to the, to the Army itself. The second priority that uh, I spent a lot of time on um, is, is a concept called people first. And it is, it's, a, it's an absorption of, of some army directives that really focus the energy of the post's uh, programs um, and capabilities towards uh, our workforce. And our workforce comprises of our, of our cadre, the drill sergeants that are here on post, the staff that surrounds them, uh, the civilian workforce that's on post here that helps, uh, helps keep Fort Jackson running. So the idea behind People First is how do you enable, empower, and protect formations and people, and that people, again, the soldiers, civilians, and their families, to be their natural best, right? To be the best version of themselves. And you would think it's a, it's a, simple, it's a simple definition, but you unpack it um, and this is where I spent a lot of my time. Enable essentially means how do I take these different programs we have on post here, anywhere from health and holistic fitness, where we focus on five aspects of, of resilience, um, to our Army wellness centers, uh, to our Army community service capabilities we have here on post, and align them in a way that there is access across uh, the post uh, between those soldiers, uh, civilians, and their families to tap into it. That's where the empower comes into play, the time and space, so empower, enable and empower, and then protect. So we know that, um, that there has been a rise in what we call harmful behaviors across, uh, across uh, the United States. So how do we get left of that, get upstream for lack of a, a more eloquent term, and it's a, it's a recent term in, in literature today, in business literature, how do you get upstream of, of of harmful behaviors. So we're implementing uh, across the post programs that help us um, recognize in this, in this melting pot of America that happens here at Fort Jackson, um, what it means to treat each other with dignity and respect. 
to get left of harmful behaviors, um, such as sexual harassment, such as suicide ideation, such as racism and extremism, in a way that we do it through education and we do it through programs itself. So that's kind of the construct of people first as a second priority. The third priority is quality of life. Uh, and when I look at that, uh, we've got a great team here, our installation management team, um, that focuses on a, a bit of the mechanics of running a post. It's a small city. Um, everything you need to run a city happens here in Fort Jackson. So when I look at our, our barracks that we have for our trainees and the soldiers, when I look at the dining facilities we have here on, on post, when I look at the privatized housing, we have about 850 families that live here on post itself. Um, these are things, and then, and then how do we provide for morale, welfare, and recreation of those families? So that they, they want to come back to Fort Jackson. The, the role of, of our drill sergeants here is a rather tough one. Right? They, are, they are the beacon, they are the coach, teach, and mentor, they are the disciplinarian of, it's basically like being a, a mother or a father, right? a surrogate mother or father to 45,000 trainees that come through here. They're up early in the morning. They get up 3, 3.30 in the morning to come into work and they put them to bed at night, the trainees at night at nine o'clock and they get home about 10 o'clock at night and they go home, eat dinner, and then turn around and do it all over again. But, they, but these cadre also have families, right? And they have kids that are in school and spouses that wanna work or wanna be part of the community itself. How do we provide for their quality of life in a way that, uh, that they go, you know what, this was a tough assignment. Um, it's a tough assignment to train tomorrow's potential, um, but this is a place that we enjoyed and we want to come back to. That's what quality of life actually means to me. And then the fourth um, priority is community engagement, both external and internal. So, um, you know, we made a contract with ourselves as a nation um, 48 years ago by becoming the all volunteer force. So. What's happened because in all volunteer forces were smaller, more technical, more sophisticated, more capable than we've ever been. All right, but couple that smaller force with also uh, what we did to access to post camps and stations after 9-11, we basically closed down the posts here. Uh, in many ways, we've become more disconnected to society than we've ever been. Uh, that civil military divide uh, is one that I, that I think about a lot. And I think about how do we reconnect America to her army? And we do it through community engagement. So we've utilized or used the, the leadership and capabilities here on post to, to, to extend a hand, to outreach, to connect uh, back to the Midlands, to South Carolina, to the nation itself, whether it's partnerships with schools, uh, the local high schools and, and, and middle schools here in Richmond one and two, um, to go out and talk to the Rotaries and the Chambers of Commerce, uh, to pair with the universities. Uh, we've got uh, relationships with USC. Um, we're pulling in Clemson uh, and all the different uh, universities uh, that, are, that are in and around the area itself. Um, how do we reconnect America to our army? Because you think about it, 50 to 75 miles outside our post camps and stations. Most people don't know the difference between this uniform and a Coast Guard uniform. And it's not because we're bad people. It's just because, because the connection of America to her, to her military is much less today than it was before. In 1990, 46% of us could have, could have named someone in close proximity to us that was serving in the military or had a direct connection to the military. Today, that's about 13%. So that's, 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 a, that's a, a real challenge to us, right? How do we connect back to uh, America in a way that allows us to, to dispel the myths of what it means to serve. You know, most people that live, there, there are people that live right off post here that have never been on post because we closed the front gates, right? So I wanna open those gates up. I wanna allow people to have the opportunity to see what, it, what an army post look like, right? We opened up some services here on post here that, that, that we had shut down because of COVID and because of security concerns to allow people to come on post and observe what it means. Many of us have this, you people our age, the mental image we have of, of what it means to serve is like stripes, right? That's the mental model, right? But that's not the case at all. This is a small city. 
and uh, it's a big family. And uh, we run this this uh, this small city in conjunction with uh, with the local community here because though we have 850 houses here on post for soldiers and their families, there's 3,200 permanent party uh, soldiers and their families and 5,000 civilians right that work here on post. So they are part of Columbia. They are part of the Midlands. They're part of the communities. And this is a big piece of, of this connecting America to our army and community engagement. So those are the four. Training and developing leaders, all right, people first, quality of life, and, uh, and community engagement. I'll tell you what I'm most proud of is every Thursday morning at nine o'clock on Hilton Field here on, on Fort Jackson, I watch the graduation of anywhere between 500 and 1200 citizens that become soldiers. And I and I watch the emotion in their in their eyes, and I and and in that ceremony, we've got somewhere between two to five thousand family members that are in the stands, and they fly from all over the United States and all over the world to watch their loved one graduate, and to see every time I ask the question of a family member, does he or she look different? Oh yeah. Do they act different? Oh yeah. Well, tell me about that, and they'll just go on for. For minutes about it. That to me is what I'm most proud of, is giving that transformational experience that we provide here. Um, and all those soldiers leaving here the best version of themselves at that particular point in time. And then maybe motivating them in some way, shape, or form to say, continue this journey. We're pretty proud of, the, of, of being a partner, um, being part of the community here for Columbia and the Midlands itself. You know, we talk about, um, I talked about this, this, this uh, the graduation every week of, of soldiers here, but that brings in a huge amount of business into the local area here. So we get about a quarter million visitors to post that are family members of the trainees that are graduating here. So that's, that's about one to $1.5 million worth of investment in the local community every week, right? And that really translates to between, between um, the service industry that supports the area around Fort Jackson and, um, and, and the basic work we do here on Fort Jackson itself translates into about a $2.3 billion um, investment into the local community every year. So we know that we have a pronounced economic impact on Columbia and the Midlands itself. And we want to continue to foster that. Um, in, in the relationships we have with local business and industry, the relationships we have with the Chamber of Commerce, the relationships we have with Columbia, um, in, in promoting a much richer um, uh, connection between business and industry and Fort Jackson itself.